And that's what we're talking about today. It's a foundational piece. And there's this truth that our habits really are like a two-edged sword. And this is a simple illustration. It's the idea um, the two-edged sword cuts both ways. And the same is true of our habits. And we all have habits. We have habits, some of, we're not even conscious of them anymore. We have habits that can be positive or they can be negative. We have some habits, we have some habits that can be helpful, right, to ourselves or to other people, or they can be hurtful and they can be harmful to ourselves and to other people. The point is, is that God created this. It's that understanding that, that, that uh, when the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, it's true, right? That God has created this amazing, complex uh, bodies that we have. And that's another one of those things that I think that maybe we don't always really, truly appreciate how complex and, and dependent, how balanced our bodies are uh, until we get older or one part of it isn't working the way it's supposed to. Does that make sense? right? Then we become really conscious of, of how God made our bodies. And, and if we have to go to doctors or go to procedures and this and that, and we find out all this information that's just amazing, right? And we look at how God created us, this whole um, relationship and the, and the whole thing with bones and, and muscles and nerves and, and the nervous system and the digestive system and eyes to see and ears to hear and a tongue to taste and a tongue to talk. And then there's that other Thing that is truly not even fully understood yet that's truly amazing and that's our brain is that our brain absolutely is this amazing thing that God created and 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 it's like daily weekly monthly they're they're, they're figuring out they like researchers and doctors are figuring out new things about the brain and how the brain works but for sure the brain controls everything else excuse me. It's this idea that I always understood muscle memory, right? I always understood muscle memory, but now I'm, I've got a new understanding, right? Um, this summer, working on the doctor of ministry and some information that Dr. Elmer Collier presented to me um, about, about how the brain works as he taught about um, redeeming routines and, and changing habits. So he took it all the way to the science part of it, right? Um, now I understand that it's not just muscle memory. It's not just our muscles remember how to do things. This all comes from the brain. In fact, think of it like this. Here's a simple way to understand it, right? Is that in our life, there's a cue, right? There's some kind of trigger that lights up a part of our brain, some of those uh, uh, nerve endings, synopsis, and so forth. There's some kind of a cue or trigger, and then we take action. There's a behavior, in other words. And then there's a result or a reward. I, I made this little uh, way to remember it. There's a cue, there's an action, and there's a benefit. Cue, action, benefit. It's how our brains work. So let me give you, start to give you some examples, okay? So um, here is this plate of Iowa soul food, right? Doesn't that look great? It's getting close to lunch, okay? So there is a great steak, baked potato, a couple fried shrimp, Texas toast, um, a nice healthy salad with a half gallon of uh, Italian dressing dumped over it. That's the way we eat in Iowa. You with me, right? That's the cue. The cue says it's time to eat. And maybe you already had a cue, your stomach's rumbling, right? And so um, what do you do? There's a cue, there's the food, it's put down in front of you, you can smell it, right? You can see it, and so you take action. And what's the action? You pick up your knife and fork, and you begin to eat it, and there's a reward. It tastes good, and it ends your hunger, right? Eating is a very simple habit that we all learned early on. And we've all pretty much mastered it. I'm assuming that nobody in this room today has to have somebody else feed them. Is that fair? Okay. We've mastered this. In fact, think about that habit. It was formed. It started to be formed when we were small, when we were little, when we were babies. I don't know what month. I didn't get into that. But, you know, the baby pretty soon is sitting in a, some kind of chair, like high chair with a tray. And there's a cue, like Cheerios are dumped on the tray, right? And so the baby starts this thing with their hands. And they start doing this. Then pretty soon we give them a little baby spoon, right? So they can start um, taking whatever, applesauce or chocolate pudding, whatever, and smear it all over their face. You take pictures, put it on Facebook, cue, action, reward. Y'all with me, right? This is the way it works, okay? Eating is a habit. It's a habit we all got into. Eating is a habit. Now I want to take a next step and understand how these habits are formed. Because you see, this is foundational. If we're going to really seriously talk about, and if you're really seriously going to do some work of changing some of your habits in one of the seven areas of your life so that you can live better, live well. Understanding how your brain works is important. Understanding it. So this week, um, I found this article, right? 
about the science uh, behind habits, right, and how God designed us to work, and it is amazing, right? This article um, is called The Truth About How Your Brain Gets Smarter by Christine Comiford. It was in Forbes magazine, okay? And uh, what she talks about are neural pathways, neural pathways in the brain. It's fascinating stuff. So she says, she writes, okay, half of your brain is made up of gray matter, where neural pathways are forged and where they reside. The other half is made up of white matter. Now, first, you need to know that n- about neurons. They fire together. They're wired together, right? It's that whole Q thing. Q, right? Q, Q action, reward, right? And so I'm going to put this next slide up on the screen. That i got to tell you a little background to this. Because this is so cool for me. Uh, this week, I like to, to push myself and do new things. And um, the next slide I have up there is like uh, from science class, right? And i got to tell you that, 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 that when I was in high school, in Greenfield High School, I thought, I assumed, I didn't get the memo, I didn't show up for orientation. I assumed high school was organized for fun. You know, just to have fun, to, to have a good time, socialize, party, play sports, right? Go to FFA, go to art class. I didn't realize learning was supposed to be involved. Now, my old teachers would say, right, we know, okay? Because I remember my science teacher, Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark was a science teacher at Greenfield High School. And, um, uh, you know, I graduated, years went by, I came back to Iowa. And I was teaching a workshop in southern Iowa. I was teaching a workshop um, for, the, for the United Methodist Church about youth ministry or whatever. And Mr. Clark was there and Mr. Cannon. Mr. Cannon was a math teacher. And after I got done presenting at this workshop, they both came up with these big, silly, goofy grins on their face. And they said, Tom, we are so glad you did something with your life. And they, they were said it lovingly, tears in their eyes. They're like, no, really, we are so proud of you. Because, you know, I just didn't live it that way. So that's a long setup for this cool illustration I'm going to give you um, to further what we're talking about. And this is like a science worksheet that Mr. Clark would have handed out and I would have blown off, but I'm not blowing it off today. What do you think? Does that look like a science worksheet? Okay. What, what we're talking about here, and again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm learning it too. But what we've got is you've got these, these nerve endings, right? You've got these, uh, where was it? Where was it? These neurons, and they fire together and they work together. Let me get back on point, Okay. This means to learn something new, to set a new habit in place. Repetition is required. When you practice something deeply and intentionally and with some element of a struggle, a neural pathway is formed. That's this gray thing is the way to think of it, right? There's this pathway, and it's like a highway. It's like a path of least resistance. It's like a default setting. It's like how your brain is wired to do things. This someone goes on, and she says, when you start to form a neural pathway, neurons are now firing together in a new sequence, and thus um, they uh, thus are wiring together as a collective. Repeated firing signals that this neural pathway is important, right? right? Repeated firing with deep practice and either struggle or ecstasy, the process of myelination begins, okay? Now, this diagram has a neural pathway, and they've got this little close-up, right? So you've got this pathway, and you've got the myelin sheath, myelin. These are, you're going to hear more about this today. The newly forged and repeatedly fired neural pathway is then insulated like an electrical wire wrapped in a protective coating. The pathway, gray matter, is strengthened uh, via the myelin, white matter, insulation. And she said, what happens is, one way to think about this, you know, I've given you some of the words, it's default setting, right? It's, it's your, your path of least resistance. She said um, this... Um, Christine Comerford says, it's basically after the repetition, 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 practice, 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 is it, it's like going from dial-up, remember dial-up internet connections, y'all remember those? Remember the funny squeaky sounds they made? Remember how slow it was? You wanted to, to download a picture or something and you had to wait 15 minutes while it gradually filled in? She says, it's like going, when the myelin gets wrapped around these uh, neural pathways, it's like going to broadband. It's like going to 300 times faster. My way to understand it is there are some things we do that are like a dirt road, and we practice them, practice them, and do them so much they become a six-lane superhighway. Y'all still with me? That's how God designed us, and I want you to hear that. She says, this writer writes about the pathway. The pathway is, is faster, right? It's become the default setting. As the brain will choose... As the brain will choose the most highly myelinated pathways, because clearly those are the most important, because they're practiced the most, this is how we form new automatic behaviors, also known as habits. That's the science behind it. 
And this is how God designed us, right? It's, it's the truth. It's how God designed us. And this applies to all of our habits and all of our routines. It's the idea that there's a neural pathway formed by the cue and action and a benefit. And when it's repeated, when it's repeated over and over and over, it makes this strong neural pathways in our brain and it becomes a habit. It becomes such that we don't have to think about it anymore. Let me give you a couple examples. One, some of you that drive an automobile, you understand that the neural pathways are so strong for you to drive that automobile, that you're able to drive sometimes many miles at a time um, out on the highway and not even know where you're at because you're thinking about other things or having a conversation or singing along with the radio, but you're not in an accident. You don't run into the ditch. Why? Because anybody ever had that experience? There's many times I feel like I wake up in the middle of Interstate 80 between Des Moines and Iowa City going, where am I? Oh, yeah, okay, that's, I'm at that exit. Why? What's going on? There's a strong neural pathway. There's a very strong neural pathway that, that, that allows uh, my muscles uh, to be coordinated and to do the things that I need to do. Take musicians, right? We have musicians in the church. Um, and it, it, what's going on there? How does, how does a musician, whether it's Leo or Stacy or Alec, they stand up here behind the piano or play guitars and this and that, they have practiced so much, starting maybe when they were little kids, right? These neural pathways were formed that told them the difference between a middle C and a high F or whatever, right? See, I don't, I don't have any of them neural pathways. Um, they, they, they have these neural pathways that tells the difference between what the black keys do and the white keys do. I have no idea, but they do. Does that make sense? How many of you are playing instrument or musicians? Anybody here you know how to play an instrument? Do you understand this is the way to, to, to get it? You have neural pathways that were formed. It was formed. It was wrapped in myelin. It's strong insulation. It's a default setting. It's something that you just know. Let me give you another example. Okay? Another example. Once a year, I go down uh, to the river. We go down to the river for the dragon boat races. Okay? So once a year for the last nine, I go down. And because I do it once a year, I don't have a neural pathway formed for this. So when I go down to get in the dragon boat, I've got to think intentionally. Okay, okay, I'm going to sit. Okay, yeah, sit on the outside of the thing, right, Emily Schleter? You're a dragon boat girl, okay? And then, oh, paddle. Yep, okay, that's right. I put my hands here, put my hand here, outside, head up, right? Look, breathe. Don't forget to breathe. Do all this kind of stuff. I don't have a neural pathway for that. Sue Miller, uh, okay, our assistant preschool director and the, uh, the uh, uh, president for life of the Dragon Boat uh, Association, Sue has done Dragon Boat thousands and thousands of times. So her neural pathways for this activity are so strong that when she gets the cue, you're in the boat. She has the paddle. She doesn't even have to think about it, right? She's got the paddle. She knows where to put her hands. She knows where to put her backside. She knows how to sit on the thing. She's got her head up. She's got her, her breathing's right and everything else. The horn blows. Boom. Action. We're going. Cue. Action. Right? There's behavior. Then there's a reward. She gets to be part of a team. She gets to be part of feeling good that she's in, 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 in unison and all this stuff. Those are just examples. The point is she has a very, very strong neural pathway for that particular activity. If you all are still with me, say yes. yes. Okay. This is how God designed us. Let me give you one for you. Let me tell you about another one of your neural pathways. Okay? You wake up in the morning. You wake up in the morning and you go, uh, like did something die in my mouth last night? Because I have morning breath that would peel paint, right? And so you go, hmm, that's a cue, right? And so what do you do? You take action. What's your action? You go into the bathroom, you pick up a brush, you pick up some toothpaste, you brush your teeth, rinse, spit, lather, rinse, repeat, whatever you do, you get a reward. And what's the reward? You don't have this reptile breath anymore, right? You can be a human. You can, you can face yourself in the mirror, right? Um, you're, you don't have cavities. You don't have all that bacteria in your mouth. It is what? It is an example of what you have, of a cue, action, of a benefit. It's an example <clears throat> of neural pathways that you have going on in your life um, every single day. It's a habit, and you probably don't even have to think about it. Let me, let me reiterate, why am I telling you all this? One, God designed us to have habits, right? Two, habits and routines really are how we live and how we move and get things done in this world. Many of us know what it's like to be out of our routines, right? And we have a little bit of a come apart, maybe. We have a little bit of a, I'm, I'm uneasy. I'm not sure how to act. Sometimes it happens when we go on vacation. Sometimes it happens if we have tragedy in our life or something bad disrupts our what? Our routines, our habits. Because God designed us to be people of habits, right? And God desires that every single one of us live well. 
That's why I'm talking about all of this. God desires that we live lives marked by faithfulness, fulfillment, and fruitfulness. Okay? That's what God desired. Remember, Jesus said, I have come to give you life, and that more abundantly. He didn't say, I came just so you'd kind of get by, so you'd just kind of go through the motions. So, yeah, you know, maybe five, maybe five, maybe four or five times out of ten, you're going to have some happiness. The rest of the time, you're on your own, buddy. He didn't say that. He said, I've come to give you life, and that more abundantly, more richly, more fulfilling, okay? This is the truth. And so here's the point. Listen, the habits that we have will directly impact and influence our experience of life. Let me repeat that to you personally. The habits that you have will directly impact and influence your experience of life. Let me say it again. The habits that I have will directly impact and influence my experience of life and living. It's a fact. And that's why we're laying this down as a foundational piece. Because you see, we've already established that um, God wants us to live, uh, uh, live well, live a good life. But if we're not living a good life and if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. If we want life to be different, we're going to have to adjust something. We're going to have to probably move the needle, right? As Dr. Bill Withers teaches from Wartburg uh, College, we've got to make us start making some incremental changes and in moving the needle. If we're a 2 in some area, we're probably not going to be a 10, probably not going to be a 10 next week. So we've got to start somewhere, right? And more specifically... Let's talk about these. Let's talk about the truth about bad habits, because we know, as I said early on, that habits, two-edged sword, right? Two-edged sword. Now think about what, what we talked about with myelin, with neural pathways and myelin, and how that becomes a default setting, how that becomes a path of least resistance. Now do you understand why, why breaking bad habits is so difficult? Breaking a bad habit, breaking an unhelpful, hurtful habit, Breaking a habit that, that's not contributing to living well, if you have repeated that over and over and over and over, your brain, the way that you are made, the biology of your body as God created you, is that you have a neural pathway wrapped strongly in myelin, and that's why it's so hard to stop some habits, right? So for example, a chemical dependency is not just the, the chemical dependency of your body, right? Right? Well, no matter what the chemical is, it is not just that. That's part of it. But understand the neural pathway is that if you've repeated that action so many times that, that, that the cue, I'm sad, I'm happy, <clears throat> the behavior, drugs, drinking, whatever, reward, numbness, no pain, whatever, that has become a neural pathway that is very, very strong. It's very strong, Okay. And that's why it's hard to break that habit. I think about my dad. My dad, and I can talk about my dad because I love him, and there's no uh, denying that. And, and, and I miss him. He's been gone about 14 years, right? But I look back at this and go, yeah, right. So my father, his feet hit the floor. He sat on the edge of the bed, and he fired up a cigarette in the morning first thing. Then he went and made coffee and did his teeth brushing and all this. Anybody know anybody like that? It's a neural pathway. It's a neural pathway. It's a behavior that is so strongly um, super highwayed into the brain that that's why it's hard to break that habit. It's hardwired, right? And hardwired for good and for bad. Let's talk about s some of the things about this, right? We know that many people are overweight or unhealthy. And let me, let me illustrate this, right? Because I have to think about this for myself. I realized this week, you know, this week on Wednesday, the best, some of the best food, some of the best food in the whole world, um, last Wednesday was tater tot casserole day. Mmm, I love it, love it, love it, love it. And I was sitting um, and was having some lunch with the staff, and I had a big bowl of my favorite meal, and I pushed it away. Terry Nichols says, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to learn a new neural pathway, I'm trying to form one. What? Terry said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, I've got an old neural pathway like some of you have, that says good kids clean their plate. Are you with me? That's a neural pathway. If that was said to you, if that was said to you over and over and over in your, in your house, in your culture, maybe it wasn't, but if it was, you see, there became this neural pathway formed, and it was wrapped in myelin every time mom or dad or grandpa or grandma or aunt said, hey, Hey, that John's a good eater. Has ever said of you, John? John, you're probably a good eater, right? Yeah, and that was like a source of pride. He's a good eater. Yeah, me too, right? He cleaned his plate up. Good, we're proud of you, Tommy. Good. That's a neural pathway, right? 
Q, behavior, reward. Clean your plate. But you see, many people, uh, like me, could probably lose some, a few pounds because I have to overcome that neural pathway that says, no matter how much food is on my plate, I've got to clean it to be a good boy. This is reality. Some people have a neural pathway that leads to some unhealthy uh, weight and so forth because, because our, our society and our culture has used food as a reward, right? Like when you'd go to the doctor, uh, doctor's office and you were a good boy or a good girl and you got one of those cool suckers with the little loop in it, right? Not a stick. You remember those? Okay. And, and you're good. And so some people you see have a neural pathway built in their brain and wrapped in myelin from repetition that says, when I am sad or when I am anxious, it's okay to eat a, a half a gallon of ice cream. It will make me feel better. And, and, and we joke about that, right? We tease about that. Um, it's been in movies. It's been in, in different things. But I'm saying this. No, let's name that for what it is, right? Because we know that being overweight is hard on our joints. We know that it's hard on our hearts. We know that it's hard on our, our nervous system. We know that it's hard on our bodies. But you see, we have to overcome neural pathways is my point. Y'all still with me? And, and, and breaking some of those habits, that's why it's hard. That's what I'm illustrating. It's hard to break that. Let's talk about exercise. Let's talk about exercise because um, <clears throat> I think breaking neural habits... People aren't in the repetition of it. It's why somebody has said to me uh, this last year that the gyms like Planet Fitness and Anytime Fitness, whatever, they all know that they're going to have this incredible surge of membership in January, right, with the resolutionaries. They call them the resolutionaries, right, and that they're going to stop in February or March. Why? Well, the science is because they haven't repeated it enough. They haven't repeated it enough for it to become a neural pathway wrapped in myelin of going to the gym and working out. It hasn't been repeated. It hasn't been uh, uh, forged in their brain. I go through this. My, my preference my preference is to, to get out of bed at 5.30 every morning and go outside and take a walk or ride my bicycle. To go out, walk for a couple miles, ride my bike uh, for, for a couple miles. That's, what I, that's a new neural pathway that I'm, that I'm trying to form. But what neural pathway... Wrapped in myelin, am I having to overcome? It's that voice that says, Tom, you really need to sleep another hour, right? You don't need to get up and exercise. You were at the church late. You're going to have a long day at church today. Notice the rationalization. That's how a neural pathway works. It's a path of least resistance. It's the, it's the broadband superhighway that's been there for too long that says, no, 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 you, you, you probably would benefit more from an hour of sleep than getting up and taking a walk, okay? But the work is and I'm just sharing part of my journey, the work is trying to create this new neural pathway. And it's hard. It's tough, okay? And we need to be real about that. And you know what? Here's another piece of this. Did you notice that article that I was quoting from? That article I was quoting from, what magazine was that from? Did you notice? Forbes. Now, is Forbes a psychology today? Christianity today? What's Forbes magazine all about? It's about business, right? Jessica Sapi, you read Forbes, don't you? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, it's a business magazine. Top uh, 500 companies, blue chip stocks, whatever. Why was an article about neural pathways and myelin in a business magazine? Well, because people who sell things have figured this out way ahead of us. Did you realize that? And they know that they're going to sell things, whether it be a, a physical product or some kind of thing like social media or video games, if they can just get you or your kids or your teenagers to form a really good, strong neural pathway wrapped in myelin because of all the repetition, and they know they got gotcha. you. Let me read you a quote from Tim Cook. Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple, right? If you don't know who that is, Apple makes all kinds of things. Quote, Apple makes products that people didn't know they wanted, but now they can't live without, right? Billion-dollar companies have figured out neural pathways and habits and repetition, right? Wrapped thickly in myelin, right? This is maybe the fifth time I've had this little wonderful invention up, on, up here on the stage with me, and I'll tell you why I have it up here, right? Is it, uh, let me ask you a question as an example of your neural pathway in myelin. How many times a day do you check your smartphone if you've got one? Anybody want to be brave enough and tell me? 50? 100? How many times an hour do you check your phone? Anybody want to volunteer that? Now I want you to answer this in your head. How many times did you check your phone five years ago? 
How many times did you check your phone every hour 10 years ago? Right? Do you understand what's going on? It's called what? It's called a neural pathway wrapped in myelin that the people that sell smartphones, Apple, Apple set down all those years ago when jo Jobs was still alive and said, you know what I wish? I wish I had a phone, not just to make phone calls, but like to text. Wouldn't it be cool if we had all this social media on there and I could check my email wherever I was and I could get on the World Wide Web wherever I was? And the Apple people are smart people. They're smart people. That's why it's one of the biggest companies in the world. And they, they figured this out. They made an Apple iPhone. Right, And then other people tried to imitate it, and many of us now carry these. And I have told you this before, and I'll tell you again, there are some days I want to take this thing and throw it as far as I can into the cornfield and hope it gets disc up and plowed over. And there's other days I get it. It's a wonderful tool, right? But I'm using it as an example of how this works in our culture, in, in our lives. Neural pathways wrapped in myelin over uh, the, the over and over and over and over repetition of doing something. I'm not really not putting phones down. I'm just using it as an example, okay? Because, see, I can actually remember, though, this is how it has an impact. This is how it has an impact in one area of life, one profession, if you will. I remember the days as a pastor when we had three things. We had landlines, right? We had a phone hanging on the wall with a curly cord that you had to undo every so often, right? We had answering machines. I had an answering machine about the size of a, of a small uh, overnight bag, right? An answering machine that had real giant cassette tapes in it. Remember those? Okay. And I had, I had an answering machine. I had a f uh, landline. And I had people that had patience. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? It was like this. It was like this. I, I wasn't hung up whether I had this in my back pocket or in my hip. I didn't freak out if my phone was on low charge. As not Probably not you, but some people freak out about that. Do you know that? If they forget their phone, if they break their phone, if their batteries run down, they're like freaked out. Oh my gosh, how am I going to check my phone? I've got to check my phone 25 times every hour, right? How am I gonna do well, some of you remember the old days. If somebody called me and I wasn't home, they left a voicemail. And when I got home, I got to it. And they were cool with that, right? So do you understand the change, right? And how I'm even trying to create a new, <laughs> a new neural pathway for you and me both. And, and, and as I've said, it may mean on some days, if you text me or email, I might not respond to you in 10 minutes. And you need to chill out. I'm going to say that as your leader because I love you. And I'm also protecting myself. You need to chill out, okay? Because you see, these neural pathways have been created very quickly. And now we think this is the way the world works. And I'm saying I'm not sure it should work that way. Fair enough? Fair enough. Okay? These are powerful little things. They're powerful little things. And I'm just pointing all of this out as an example, not to say that we're bad, not to say that we're rotten, not to say that we're horrible, no good, sinful people, but to say that we are God's children created in God's image. Right? Right? And we are, we are created as people of habit, and some of our habits may need to be changed. And changing them is difficult. Changing them can be hard. But understand, even Jesus, Lord, Savior, Messiah, had habits. He had habits. He had godly habits. We read about one of them. It said that Jesus went in to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, right? As was his habit. This was his habit. Right? I mean, literally, you can say that the, the human Jesus, from the time he was born, and we get those stories um, that, you know, Joseph and Mary lost him. Remember, they weren't the, like the brightest parents, right? They lost him. Remember that story? Where did they lose him? Well, they, they found him again at the synagogue. It was a neural pathway formed in Jesus' human brain, wrapped in Lotsam Island, that as was his custom, he worshipped and read and heard the word of God. There's this scripture right, that points out another one of Jesus' habits. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus had this habit of talking to God and listening for God. He had this habit, right? And, and, and again, we're formed in, in the image of God, as was Jesus. We are people of habit. But understand where, where God took this with Paul, right? Is that Paul said to this, one of these first churches and to this young pastor, train yourself for godliness. So here's where it hits the road, all right? Here's where it hits the road is that there is this, there is this teaching from God about your habits, about my habits. And the teaching from God, the good news from God, is train yourself for godliness. What does that mean? It means practice it. It means repetition. 
Repetition. Repetition. All right? Train yourself for godliness. In the same way that Sue Miller gets in a dragon boat, she is trained to be really good at that. In the same way that somebody that plays uh, the piano for the church or the organ or whatever has trained themselves through repetition, 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 so they can play an instrument. God said train yourself. Let me, let me put words into Paul's mouth. How about that? That's always kind of fun, right? Oh, let me speak for you, Paul. Let me interpret what Paul was saying to Timothy and what he's saying to us. Paul was saying when he said train yourself for godliness, Paul was saying practice, practice, right? Like how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Paul was saying practice repetitively, consistently. Practice Christ-like acts and spiritual exercise, exercises. Paul was saying, look, practice, repetition. You need to create neural pathways that are wound tightly and thickly with insulating myelin so that praying and worshiping, and gathering with God's people, and being Christ-like in your love, and your grace, and your forgiveness, and your truth, being Christ-like and worshiping is as natural and as easy in our default setting as feeding yourself. Are you still with me on that, church? Does that make sense? That's what he says, one sentence. I had to add a whole bunch of other sentences. Train yourself. Create, because God created this first. Create those neural pathways that will help you, that will help you be godly as a habit, that will help you be Christ-like as a habit, that will help you be uh, loving, forgiving, right? That will help you be non-anxious, that will help you be all those things that Christ modeled easily, right? See, our work, our work, folks, to live well is to honestly assess publicly, privately. We, we need to honestly assess our public and our private habits. Let me make this more personal because your job is to assess yours, not mine. And my job isn't to assess your public or private hab habits. I can comment on them. And as you notice, I try and bring uh, you all along and I preach to myself. But I I'm, I'm saying clearly, it starts with yourself. And our work in living well, our work in, in living the life God wants is honestly assessing our public and private habits and to work to change those, right? And know that ending one habit and creating another one takes time. It really is moving the needle. It is repetition. It is training. And so you start it in small steps. That's our work, is to look at those seven areas of our life. And it isn't going to happen this week or this month. It's where you start. The journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, right? It's looking at your habits and routines with health. It's looking at your habits and routine in the spiritual area. It's looking at habits and routines in the leisure area. And you begin to change things and add things. You know, relationships. Um, every Sunday, I make a phone call to somebody in my family. I've stopped texting them. I've told some of you this, right? That isn't it. Doesn't sound like a big thing, doesn't it? What? You're finally calling your mom? Yeah, I am. Right? Because it's a move the needle in incremental change. As opposed to, you know what? I'm going to start driving five hours every week and go down and spend a day with my mom. I can't do that. Are you with me? You start incrementally. You make changes to your habits. So let's say, for example, that, that you really, you really want to know more of God's word. All right? So you might be all in just kind of like the resolutionaries, right? In January, I'm going to go to the gym every day. I'm going to work out for two hours. And after like a week of that, you quit, okay? It's about creating a neural pathway. So if you say, well, I want to know more of God's word, you know what I'm going to do? For the next, for the next 15 days, I'm going to read the Bible for two hours straight. Well, maybe you can do that, but I'm going to say you're probably setting yourself up to fail. You agree with that? Why don't you do 15 minutes first thing in the morning or 10 minutes at the end of your day? 10 minutes reading God's word. Or, 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 you know, read God's Word as part of your cell book whenever you do your devotional time. Do that repetitively, consistently. Train yourself to be godly. Why don't you do 10 minutes of that for 10 days and see if you begin to make a neural pathway wrapped in myelin. It's an incremental change. Does that make sense to everybody? Or what about this? Last week I talked about how we're killing ourselves with fear and worry and anxiety and stress and doubt and negativity and how we wake up in the middle of the night and we watch the parade of the imaginary horribles. There's a cue, you see, there's a cue, right? 
There's a cue. You wake up and you're worried. And so there's a behavior, right? You fret, you, you worry, you make yourself sick. That's your reward. You make yourself sick. What if you did this? What if you begin to substitute that habit? That you, you have a strong neural pathway there wrapped in myelin that makes you lay awake and worry and fret and stress and be burned out. And What if you begin to pray instead? What if today, tonight, this week, when you get that cue to start worrying, what if you begin to call out to God? Seriously, what if you begin to pray to God about that thing? Like, for real, like, God, I'm going to really, really give this to you. I don't mean I'm going to give it to you halfway. I don't mean I'm going to say, God, I'm really worried about work, this. Now, you, you know, maybe you do something about it, but I'll, I'll just continue to lay here and worry. That's not trust, and that's not love. What if you begin to pray, and this became something you did? Remember, you've got to do this over and over and over and over. It's about repetition. It's about practice to create truly, truly a neural pathway wrapped in myelin that changes your life, right? So you begin to worry as your cue. You begin to pray as your behavior. And your reward is, not only can you go back to sleep, but you begin to have a new dependence upon God and a new habit of talking to God, of being stressed out. Imagine how that might change your life. You know, here's the thing. Jesus was really clear. He was really clear in that gospel lesson that we read when he said, I'm here. I am here. My mission is right? My work is to set the prisoners free and to rele release uh, those who are oppressed, right? So I end this and give this to you. Only you can name that one habit, that one routine that is making you a prisoner, that's holding you prisoner to an unhealthy mind, to an unhealthy body. Only you can name this habit that's holding you a prisoner, making you oppressed. You're oppressed by loneliness, or maybe you're oppressed by anger. Maybe you're oppressed by this sense that everybody owes you something. You're a victim. Maybe you're oppressed by weariness. You're just tired. Maybe you're oppressed by feeling burnt out, and you don't care. Maybe you're oppressed by being scared to death. Jesus said, now listen, Jesus said, I have come to set you free. I've come to set you free. So may we trust that. May we believe that. May we call out to God for God's help and guidance in becoming more free and living well. Let's pray about that right now. Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus for your intercession, for your help for each and every one of us you know us. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, we can't keep anything a secret from you. You know how we are. You know what we think. You know what we do. You love us in spite of that. So Lord God, out of your love for us, out of your care and concern, I pray again that you intercede. That you intercede, intervene, and help us. Help us, Lord to train ourselves in godliness. Give us the courage. Give us the strength. Be in control if we just flat out need you to be in control. I pray this for myself. I pray this for every single person in this room. I pray for your help in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, we pray that prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 